What up, everybody? This is your boy Tech G back with another video. And today we're going to be talking about basic networking concepts. So in this video, you will learn about basic networking concepts such as the basics of network communication, device addresses, basic networking protocols and networking devices. All right. So let's talk about the basics of network communication. Data communication refers to the transmission of digital data between two or more computers and a computer network or data network. The physical connection between network computing devices is established using either cable media or wireless media. Network communication works very differently than communication between a peripheral and a, co and a computing device. When your computer sends a print job to a printer connected to a USB port, the connection is direct between the two devices and is a single stream of information. Network communication between two devices is more complicated. The information must be turned into small bits, also known as packets, which may be sent via different paths and must be reassembled at the destination in the correct order. All right, let's talk about basics of packet transmission. So everything a user does on the Internet involves packets. Every web page that a user receives comes as a series of packets, as well as every email a user sends out is sent out as a series of packets. Networks that ship data around in small packets are called packet switched networks. Another way to visualize this is to think of yourself ordering a dining room table set off of a website. On the website, you see an image of the complete dining room set, the tables and the chairs. When the vendor prepares to ship you the table, the vendor has to break down the table and chairs and wrap them in their own boxes, along with a set of instructions on how to reassemble the unit. Once that is complete, the vendor attaches a shipping label with your home address to each box or one label for the entire pallet to be delivered to your home. Once the boxes or the pallet arrives at your home, you must open each box and begin the process of assembling the table and chairs as per the instructions given so that you can have the dining room set in your house that you saw on the vendor's website. When information is sent over a network connection, the information is divided into packets. Assume that a file could be divided into 100 packets. All of the packets need to contain the origin and destination information to prevent the information from becoming corrupted along the way. All the packets need to contain error checking information because the packets need to be reassembled at their destination. Each packet needs to identify where it belongs in the finished product, i.e. packet 01, packet 02, etc. As the packet flows through the network, devices known as routers determine which packets stay in the network which ones are routed to their destination and the best route to follow. The destination information in the packets enable the routers to determine where the packets are going. As the packets travel, they are intermingled with many other packets going to many other destinations. When the packets reach the destination, the information contained in each packet enables the destination device to reassemble the information in correct order so it can be acted upon, meaning to send a web page, download a file, etc. The response is packetized and sent back to the requesting device in a similar fashion. I know that sounds confusing, but basically when you send a request to a website or a server out there somewhere, basically your information is going to be traveling over a bunch of switches and routers or mostly routers. And they're going to break that information up into bits, also known as packets, like I said. And those bits can travel all types of different directions as long as they get to their main destination. When they get to the main destination, the destination has to reassemble all those bits back into its proper order to uh, properly get you the information that you're receiving. And then it reverses the entire process to send the information back that, to you that you were requesting. All right, let's talk about domain name servers or domain name systems. So the domain name system is the phone book of the Internet. Human um, humans access information online through domain names like Facebook and YouTube.com. Web browsers interact through Internet protocol addresses. DNS translates domain names to IP addresses so browsers can load Internet resources. When you enter the name of a website or click a link to a particular Web page, 
The technical name for what you have typed or clicked is a uniform resource locator, also known as a URL. DNS is worked by translating a URL into the actual IP address used by that resource. The DNS is the name for the network of servers on the Internet that translates domain names such as Google.com and individual host names into their matching IP addresses. If you manually configure an IP address, you typically provide the IP addresses one or more DNS servers as part of the configuration process. And DNS uses port 53. So the easiest way you guys can think about a DNS is just to think of this in terms of your phone. Every last one of us has a phone, iPhone, Android, or whatever it is that you have, and we all have phone numbers that are stored into the iPhone. Now, how many of you guys out there have actually memorized all the phone numbers that are stored into your phone? Chances are very few of you have all those phone numbers memorized. You might have just your phone number memorized, maybe your mother and maybe your wife or your girlfriend or whoever. That's it. Most of us, what we do when we get a phone number We'll take that information, we'll punch it into our phone, and we will assign a name to it like mom, wife, girlfriend, son, kid, whatever. And so instead of us having to memorize that phone number, we just go look up mom, press mom, and then guess what? That name gets linked to the phone number that, is, that has been assigned to mom, and it commences to dial mom's phone or house line. So that is how essentially DNS has worked because... Nobody has time to be sitting around trying to memorize IP addresses, but we can remember names like Google, Twitter, Yahoo, YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. Let's talk about URL to IP translation. So DNS relies on special servers located across the Internet known as DNS servers. Each Internet service provider, also known as an ISP, provides the IP addresses of one or more, typically two, DNS name servers to the device that connected. DNS name servers, often simply called DNS servers, uh, receive information about websites and the IP addresses matching them. And they use this information to translate URLs into IP addresses. When an IP address is provided and its URL is translated, that is an example of a reverse DNS lookup. Let's talk about LAN versus WAN. A local area network, also known as a LAN, is a computer network with a small geographic location, uh, such as a home, school, computer laboratory, office building, or a group of buildings. A LAN is composed of interconnected workstations and personal computers, which are each capable of accessing and sharing data and devices, such as printers, scanners, and data storage devices anywhere on the LAN. LANs are characterized by higher communication and data transfer rates and the lack of any need for leased communication lines. So basically, in your house, if you guys got a little router in there, you got your smartphones, your tablets and your computers, uh, pretty much you are operating a LAN. That is what you are operating inside of your house. Let's go on to a WAN. A, a wide area network is a network that exists over a large scale geographic area. A WAN connects different smaller networks, including LANs and, and metro area networks, also known as MANs. This ensures that computers and users in one location can communicate with computers and users in other locations. WAN implementation can be done either with the help of the public transmission system or a private network. The Internet is an example of a WAN. So basically a WAN connects multiple LANs across the world together via the Internet. Let's talk about device addresses. So there are two ways a network device can distinguish itself from another device on the network. The first way is by having an IP address. And the second way is by having a media access control address, also known as a MAC address. IP addresses. So an IP address is a unique address that identifies a device on the Internet or local network. It allows the system to be recognized by other systems connected via the uh, Internet protocol. 
The type of networking that is used for WAN, such as the internet, is called transmission control protocol. Internet protocol, more commonly referred to as TCP IP. TCP IP networking is also used for LANs, even those that usually do not connect to the internet. Every device on a TCP IP network is identified by a unique IP address. There are two versions of IP addresses. The first version is called IP version four that uses a 32 bit address composed of four numbers ranging from zero to 255. So an example of an IP address, IP version four address would be 192.168.1.154. If any part of the IP address has a greater value than 255, it is not a valid IP address. So if you see an IP address that says 256.0.300.12, that is not an IP address because 256 and 300 are greater than 255. A local loopback IP4 address 127.0.0.1 is assigned to each computer and is only used for testing. Next, you have the IP version six that uses a 128 bit address composed of eight groups of hexadecimal numbers, some of which can be zeros. So we have an example right here. That's that very long character string starting with 2602. That will be considered an, an example of an IP version six address. Also, another thing about IP version six addresses, if you look at this particular address, you'll see a series of zeros in the middle of it. Um, normally what you can do instead of if you had if you had to theoretically write all this stuff out, you can shorten it down by replacing the two sets of zeros or however many sets of zeros is in there. You can replace those with double colons. And also the loop back address for an IP version six address is colon colon one. Let's talk about these IP version four addresses in a little more detail. So IP version four su supports up to two to the 32 or 4.2 billion IP addresses that are visible to all devices. Due to the massive number of network devices in the world, everything from computers to tablets to smartphones to printers, et cetera, there simply are not enough IP version addresses to meet this demand. IP, for, IP version four addresses are available in two forms. You have public and private. Public IP addresses are assigned to servers on the internet and to ISPs, your internet service providers. Private IP addresses, they usually start with 192.168. They are assigned to networks that connect to the internet using a router, such as a small office or a home office network. A feature known as network address translation or NAT included in, is included in routers and it enables a public IP address to provide access to multiple private addresses on a network. So you can think of NAT translation like, um, just think of NAT translation like the street that you live on. Let's just say you live on 123 Main Street. On 123 Main Street, that's the public uh, address of the street that you live on. There's probably like 20 houses on that street. Your house might be, um, I guess, 123 Main Street is a bad example. Let's just say you live on Main Street. So Main Street would be the public address. Your private address would be 123 Main Street identifying your house. So you could think of it in that manner. All right, let's talk about uh, classes of IP addresses. So any device that has an IP address is referred to as a host. IP version four addresses are divided into class A, B, and C categories. Class A ranges from 0 .0 .0 0.0.0 to 127.0.0.0. It supports 16,777,216 hosts, each on 128 networks for a total of over 2.1 billion addresses. So 2.1 billion addresses can be created inside of a class A network. Class B has a range from 128.0.0.0 to 191.255.0.0. It supports 65,536 hosts on each of 16,384 networks for a total of 1 billion addresses. 
Then we have Class C that ranges from 192.0.1.1 to 223.255.254.254. That supports 256 hosts on each of 2 million networks for a total of over 536 million addresses. The remainder of the 4.2 billion available IP addresses are set aside for classes D and E, which are not used for normal IP addressing. And that's an example of what an IP version 4 address looks like. IP version 6 addresses. So IP version 6 network address format is much different than that of the IP version 4 format. It contains eight sets of four hexadecimal digits and uses colons to separate each block. IP version six, because it, is, it uses a much larger address size where it has two to the 128. Um, that, that translates into about 340 undecillion, some word I never heard of, or 3.4 times 10 to the 38 address. Basically, it's a whole bunch of addresses out there. <laughs> so, um, but basically what it's saying is there should never be a shortage of IP addresses. In theory, there should never be a shortage of IP addresses. Um, IP version six, IP version uh, six is replacing is replacing IP version four networking. But the process will take some time. So for now, a feature called tunneling is required, which uh, enables IP version four addresses to work on an IP version six Network, and you will learn about this stuff in future classes. You just have to be familiar with the concepts for this class. All right, so let's talk about DHCP. So, regardless of if a device has an IP version 4 or an IP version 6 address, or both, the IP address is assigned by a device called a Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, or a DHCP server that resides on the network. The DHCP server may be built into the router or a separate device on larger networks. A device that is connected to different networks through the course of a day will receive a different IP address as it connects to different networks. If a device that is normally assigned an IP address by a DHCP server cannot connect to the DHCP server, it assigns itself what is called an automatic private IP addressing protocol or a PIPA address. These addresses are randomly assigned from the range of 169.254.1.0 through 169.254.254.255. Devices that use a PIPA addresses can connect to each other on a LAN but they cannot connect to other networks or to the internet until the DHC, DHCP server starts working again. So you could think of a PIPA as a sort of reserved IP address until the DHCP is rebooted so that people can get access to the internet. But until that thing is uh, restarted or rebooted or whatever, that machine that has that quote unquote reserved IP address will not be able to leave that local area network to get out to the greater internet. Let's talk about Mac addresses. So a media access control, also known as a Mac address or a physical address is a hardware identification number that uniquely identifies each device on a network. The Mac address is manufactured into every network card, such as an Ethernet card or a Wi-Fi card, and therefore cannot be changed. Every device that is network capable has a unique Mac address composed of six groups of two character hexadecimal numbers, uh, the number zero through nine or the letters A through F. The numbers may be displayed in groups of two or a string of values. MAC addresses may be written in upper or lower case um, characters. The MAC address is assigned by the device manufacturer and is used to determine which device or devices will receive data. Network adapters have the MAC address on the label. Uh, you can determine the MAC address by using the network utilities covered in previous sections. A device that can connect to two different networks at the same time, such as a router, will have two different MAC addresses, one for each connection. 
Some operating systems and utilities allow the MAC address for a network device to be changed. This is referred to as MAC spoofing. And you'll learn about that in future classes. Let's talk about basic protocols. A protocol is a set uh, is a standard set of rules that allows electronic devices to communicate with each other. These rules include what type of data may be transmitted, what commands are used to send and receive data, and how data transfers are confirmed. The key network protocols you must understand for the IT fundamental certification exam are listed below in the chart. And the TCP port numbers are used in are used to, di to direct different types of network traffic. So look at this chart here. You, these are the ones you got to be concerned with. HTTP and HTTPS that is used for web browser traffic. HTTP uses port 80. HTTPS uses port 443. Then you have POP3 that's for receiving email. It uses port 110. IMAP for receiving email uses ports 143 and 993. Um, and SMTP is used for sending email and uses ports 25 or 587. So we're going to go ahead and talk about these in a little bit more detail. HTTP and HTTPS. So HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. HTTPS stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secured. HTTP is the underlying protocol used by the World Wide Web, and this protocol defines how messages are formatted and transmitted and what actions web servers and browsers should take in response to various commands. Hypertext uh, refers to the hyperlinks contained in many web pages. These links can be clicked to request information from another server. A website such as the example HTTP colon slash slash www.thiswebsite.com that makes an unencrypted connection while https colon slash slash this website.com makes a secure connection also known as an encrypted connection originally secure connections were used mainly for electronic banking or shopping however many websites are now requiring secure connections to protect users and websites from attack a normal connection such as HTTP colon slash slash uses TCP port 80 and the secure connection HTTPS colon slash slash uses TCP port 443. Secure connections also display a padlock icon next to the web address. Let's talk about POP3. So POP3 stands for Post Office Protocol 3, and it is the third version of a widespread method of receiving email. Similar to the physical version of a post office clerk, POP3 receives and holds email for an individual until they pick it up. All versions of POP work by checking an email server and downloading new messages to your email client app. For users who only have one computer, POP3 works very well. However, for users who switch between computers, POP3 and earlier versions have a major limitation. If you retrieve email on a desktop computer and on a laptop, each computer will have only some of the messages until you configure your email server to keep a copy of your email. When the server keeps a copy of your downloaded email, you might download the same messages over and over. Email systems that utilize POP3 servers to retrieve email typically use SMTP, known stands for Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, to send email. POP3 uses TCP port 110. Many email systems now use IMAP protocol instead. So basically, a POP server works like this. Your email resides on the server right there. Now, whatever device that you are using, you are going to have to download that email from the server onto your device. So if you're just using one computer, this is not going to be a problem because this is the only device that you are using to check email from that particular server. But if you want to check email from your computer or from your laptop or from your tablet or from your phone, well, guess what? You're going to have to download that message to each device. But the problem that arises is if you download it, to your phone and then you try to go download it to your computer, 
the message may or may not be there because you downloaded or you deleted it from whatever device that you originally downloaded the message to. Let's talk about IMAP. So Internet Message Access Protocol, also known as IMAP, is an Internet standard protocol used by email clients to retrieve email from a mail server over a TCP IP connection. Instead of downloading messages to the user's computer, IMAP displays messages when received and enables the user to keep them on the server and organize them in folders. If a user checks for email using IMAP on multiple devices, all devices can show all of the user's email. A user can delete IMAP messages whenever necessary. Multiple users can check a single email box at the same time. When configuring a new email service, the user must select the protocol to use. Some services support only one protocol, whereas others allow you to choose between IMAP and POP3. IMAP4 is the current version of IMAP. IMAP uses TCP port 143. So how IMAP works is it keeps your emails on the server. So when you go to look at your email from your phone, laptop, computer, or whatever, it does not download the email to your device. Instead, it keeps it sitting on that server, which allows for you to look at the device, look at the email from any device that you want without having to worry about downloading the same email over and over again. So it keeps it there on the server and allows for you to get access, uh, quote unquote, access to the server to view the email as it sits on the server. SMTP stands for Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. So SMTP is a protocol for sending email messages between servers. Most email systems that send email over the Internet use SMTP to send messages from one server to another. The messages can then be retrieved with an email client using POP or IMAP. In addition, SMTP is generally used to send messages from a mail client to a mail server. SMTP uses TCP port 25. When configuring email settings on a client, you need to know the server's types used. I mean, you need to know if it's going to be SMTP, POP3, or IMAP. The ports you, you need to also know the ports that are used. The default values may be changed by some ISPs. You need to know the username and password for the email service and the security settings. So check with your ISP or the organization that provides internet access for the correct value. So how SMTP works, you could think of this in terms of Google Gmail. So let's just say you have a Gmail account and your friend has a Gmail account over here. You compose a message inside of Gmail. You send that email off. Or let's just say you have Gmail and they have Yahoo Mail. OK, you, you compose your message inside of Gmail. You send that email off. Well, that mail is going to use when, when it hits the server and the server sends the message out, it's going to use SMTP to send it to the Yahoo server. So this is just a way that two different servers send your messages back and forth to each other until it's time for you or your recipient to retrieve the email. And then when you retrieve it, you're going to be using either POP3 or IMAP, like I discussed earlier. All right, let's talk about SSL and TLS, secure. So security layers that you will encounter are SSL and TLS. SSL stands for Secure Socket Layer. That is an encryption technology used by secured websites, those that start with HTTPS. Um, to access a secured website, the web browser must support the same encryption level used by the secured website, normally 128-bit encryption, and the same versions of SSL used by the website, normally SSL version 2.0 or 3.0. Sites secure with SSL display a padlock besides the browser's um, URL and often a green address bar if secured by a certificate. TLS stands for transport layer security, and that is the successor to SSL. SSL3 was somewhat of a prototype to TLS, but it was never fully standardized. TLS was ratified by the IETF in 1999. However, many people and companies still refer to TLS as simply SSL. So when you guys are going to websites and you look up in the URL browser, 
You will, if you see a padlock next to the website name, that means this website has been secured using uh, TLS. Let's talk about devices. So networking requires hardware devices as well as software. The software needed for networking is built into both desktop, laptops, and mobile operating systems. Network adapters are also built into these devices, or they can be added by connecting an adapter to a USB port. However, other devices are needed to make a connection to the internet. So here are some of these devices. You have what is called a modem. Modem stands for modulate, demodulate, and it is a hardware device that converts data into a format suitable for a transmission medium so that it can be transmitted from one computer to another. Modems were originally created for the process of changing digital signals into analog signals sent over telephone lines to a remote computer. Modem now refers to any device used to connect a computer or network to the Internet. So if you guys have Internet access in your house, chances are you have a modem that looks similar to this up in there especially if you're using cable internet. Let's talk about a router. A router is a networking device that forwards data packets between computer networks. Routers perform the traffic directing functions of the internet. Data sent through the internet, such as a web page or email, is in the form of data packets. A packet is typically forwarded from one router to another router, through the networks that constitute the internetwork or the internet until it reaches its destination. A router has at least two network connections that use RJ45 cables. The port, the port that is labeled uh, WAN connects the router to a modem. The port labeled LAN, local area network, connects the router to a switch. If a router has a built-in switch, it has multiple LAN ports numbered starting at one. Most routers today are wireless routers that combine a router, a switch, and an access point. A router has two IP addresses because it has two network connections. One network connection uses a private IP address and is used to attach to the LAN ports, which are ports numbered one through four or higher. The other network connection is the one used to connect to the internet via a modem. And this is the public IP address. So this is what a, uh, a router would look like. This is made by Cisco. Um, these are not the type of routers that you will find inside of your house. <laughs> but um, Or you might, depending upon what it is that you do. But these things are, just like this thing said, they are responsible for routing traffic back and forth across the Internet so that you can get from your computer or smartphone to Amazon, YouTube, Facebook, or whatever website that it is that you look at. Next device we have is called a switch. A switch is a high speed device that receives incoming data packets and redirects them to their destination on a local area network. Essentially switches are the traffic cops of a simple local area network. A switch enables direct connections between any two computers or devices on the network. Switches are available with as few as four or five RJ45 ports or with a dozen ports. Switches can be connected to each other so that a small network can grow without needing to replace existing switches. Most switches support at least fast Ethernet, which is 100 megabits per second signaling with gigabit Ethernet, which is 1,000 megabits per second, becoming common in home and small office networking. 10 gig Ethernet switches are now used in enterprise networks. A managed switch can organize its switch ports into several logical networks that cannot interfere with each other. A managed switch enables two different companies or departments to have independent networks in the same location. To enable a network switch to connect to the Internet, a, uh, connect the switch to a router. Many routers made for home or small offices include a multi-port switch and a wireless access point. So switches are essentially direct traffic between local area networks, as, like you can see in this diagram. They manage all the traffic that is trying to all these computers are connected to the switch and, they're con and the switch is also connected to the printer and the router. This thing manages all the traffic that is trying to access the printer or trying to get to the router so we can get out to the Internet. 
Also, you can use a switch, like you said, to divide a company into uh, logical networks, meaning let's say you have the Acme company and inside the Acme company, they have the IT department, the HR department, they have the marketing department. Well, each department can utilize, in theory, one switch and create their own little individual networks inside of that switch to where the IT department, they won't be able to jump over into the uh, marketing department or the HR department and vice versa. And you can manage each network inside of the switch as its own little independent land is what that is saying. And here is the, an example of a switch or a router or combination switch that you might find inside of your house. And this thing has a, like I said, this is a router slash switch slash access point. And let's talk about access points. So a wireless access point, also known as a WAP, W-A-P-R and A-P, is a network hardware device that allows other Wi-Fi devices to connect to a wired network. The AP usually connects to a router via a wired network as a standalone device, but it can also be an integral component of the router itself. To connect the wireless network to a wired network, connect the RJ45 port on the AP to a switch on a wired network. If the wired network is connected to a router with internet access, the wireless network will also have internet access. As previously mentioned, a wireless router combines a router with an ethernet switch and an access point. You will often see these things all over the place. If you work in corporate America somewhere, just look up in the ceiling and you'll normally see one of these devices hanging off the ceiling somewhere, which will allow for you to get access to the network, especially if you're using Wi-Fi. All right, let's talk about firewalls. A firewall is a network security system that monitors and controls incoming and outgoing network traffic based on predetermined security rules. A firewall typically establishes a barrier between a trusted internal network and an untrusted external network, such as the internet. Firewalls can be either software or hardware, Firewalls are frequently incorporated into wireless routers. You can find them also inside of Microsoft Windows and Mac operating systems. Software firewalls are also known as host firewalls. So a firewall pretty much works like this. A computer from outside the network attempts to gain access to the email server on the network. The network has a firewall because no computer on the network has sent a uh, request to the outside computer. Um, I just lost where I was reading. Because no computer on the network has sent a request to the outside computer, the firewall blocks the incoming traffic from that computer. A computer on the network sends a request to a remote server hosting a website. The remote server sends the answer back to the computer on the network. Because the remote server is responding to a request from the network, the firewall permits the incoming traffic. So basically a firewall, you can think of this as a bouncer at a club. <laughs> I'm pretty sure all of you have gone to a club and there's this big buff dude standing outside with his, uh, with his little list or somebody next to him with a list saying who is allowed to come into the club and, and who can't come into the club. So think of the club as your home. Think of the bouncer as your firewall and think of all the people standing in line outside as the Internet who are trying to get into your home. That is essentially how a firewall works in a nutshell. All right. So that's the end of the lesson. So let's go ahead and get into some check on learning. Which of the following is not a possible IP version for address? Not a possible IP version for address. Would it be 172.16.4.257? Would it be 0 0.1.2.3? Would it be 192.168.0.1? Or would it be 127.0.0.1? Which of the following is not a possible IP4 version address? Correct answer is 172.16.4.257. And the reason why is because of the number 257. Remember I told you when it comes to IP4 version addresses, 
You cannot have a number in there that is greater than 254. Make sure it's 254 and not 255. I want to give you guys the correct information. Oh, it cannot be greater than 255. <laughs> so the number 257 is obviously greater than 255. All right, next question. When you enter a website URL into your web browser window, which of the following matches it to a particular server IP address so you get the right page? Would it be NAT? Would it be DNS? Would it be WAN? Or would it be TCP IP? So when you enter a website URL into your web browser window, meaning you're trying to get to a certain website, which of the following takes your IP address, uh, takes the name that you entered and converts it into the proper IP address? Correct answer is DNS, domain name server or domain name system. It takes the words YouTube.com and matches it up against its appropriate IP address so that you can get to YouTube.com and watch my YouTube videos. Also, another thing you guys need to be concerned about when you're taking these uh, certification exams, you need to get familiar with all of these acronyms. Now, I've been explaining these acronyms out, uh, explaining them out. I've been, I've, been, <laughs> I've been telling you what these acronyms stand for, but when you guys go take these tests and you start answering these questions, more than likely, they're probably not going to tell you what those acronyms stand for. So you need, to, you need to understand what these acronyms mean. And also, you need to be wary of some acronyms mean multiple things in re when it comes to IT. So you need to be mindful of that as well. I have a, you go to my website, Technology G, I actually have a resource page up there that explains what all of these acronyms stand for. All right, final question. A coworker is concerned about receiving all of their email when they switch from their work desktop computer to a laptop computer for a business trip. Which protocol is their email most likely using? Is it HTTPS? Is it IMAP? Is it POP3? Or is it webmail? So the coworker, they are concerned that uh, about trying to access their email once they go from their desktop to their laptop. So which one of these protocols would bring concern? The correct, the correct answer would be POP3. And why this is is because, like I told you guys earlier, when it comes to POP3, the email that is stored on the email server POP3, once you access the email via your computer, your laptop, or your phone, that server sends that email to that device. And then if you try to go access it through another device, well, the message may or may not be there. Now, if you want the message to remain on the server, so that you can access the message anytime you want from any device that you want, then you need to utilize IMAP. IMAP keeps the message on the server. All right, so that is pretty much all I have to say for this class. So in summary, we have talked about basic networking concepts such as the basics of network communication, device addresses, basic networking protocols, and networking devices. For more information on this and those acronyms I told you guys about, go visit my website, Technology G, so you can get read up on the latest and greatest information so that you can successfully pass your CompTIA IT Fundamentals Certification Exam. And until next video, peace.